Welcome back to Nexperia Power Live, and you're watching our GAN channel. We're about to start with our third session of the day. Here, live with you, are Sebastian and Giuliano, who will discuss the requirements and challenges when analyzing fast switching GAN devices. The session will take about 25 minutes, first presentation, and then questions. Questions are anonymous, and you can ask yours using the question pane on the right hand side of your screen. So please ask your questions to our experts or share your own experience and insights. And with that, I'll hand over to Sebastian and Giuliano to begin. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome to this session on the switching evaluation of fast GAN devices. My name is Sebastian Klötze and I'm a principal application engineer at Nixperia located in Hamburg. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Giuliano Cassato and I'm responsible for the Ghana marketing and commercial activity. Today I'll be taking care of uh, your questions related to commercial topics. Thank you. Over to you, Sebastian. Thank you, Giuliano. So, the outline. Uh, modern GAN devices in low inductance SMD packages, such as the CC pack that you can see on the right hand side, enable very fast and clean switching transients. Now, to benchmark these and capture what's really going on, we need an optimized test platform, a suitable measurement setup, and proper preparation and post processing to really see. Um, what is exactly going on and what are the results, for example, of the switching analysis. Now, in general, good technique is required for all switching investigations, but it's uh, even more mandatory to follow the basic guidelines for GAN, since these devices can usually switch faster and more efficiently than most silicon and silicon carbide transistors. Now for the basic setup, again, this presentation um, is mostly focusing on the double pulse analysis, which is um, a direct measurement to evaluate most application related parameters, such as voltage and current slopes, reverse recovery, gate drive performance, for example, at different voltage, current and temperature. And it has a higher precision for a hard switching loss analysis. But when we do resonant switching and want to analyze, analyze this, um, it's not the best solution. And for this case, indirect measurements are usually required. Why is that the case? Now, if you have a look at the half bridge current measurement setup for the double pulse, um, basically um, when we do this test, we will lead to, uh, it will lead to this uh, waveforms. On the left-hand side, it's the drain source voltage in black. On the right-hand side, source current, gate source voltage. And when we do um, the switching loss analysis, we do it in the way that we multiply the drain source voltage and the source current, which leads to the switching loss um, waveform that you can see here. And now if we evaluate this um, at the E off and E on um, instant of time, we can see um, both can be measured quite, quite well. And also you can see even for fast switching GAN devices, the E on energy is usually a lot higher than the E off. That is due to the uh, case that uh, fast switching devices are usually able to turn off the channel very quickly. And therefore most that is captured here is just uh, charging of the parasitic capacitances. And therefore the E off value that we capture for low to medium currents is usually the EOSS value. At high current, it's it's slightly different. The, the loss component increases, but for low currents, we usually measure this. Um, now, if we do the total analysis um, or the analysis of the total switching energies, we just simply add E off and E on, and usually we get to a range of tens to one hundreds of microjoules. So um, any error that we introduce in this measurement is it's still impactful, but it's uh, it's limited in terms of error that we introduce overall in terms of uh, relative error. Also, since we add both, if we do some kind of small error in the E off calculation, it might uh, lead to a slightly lower E on, and that might compensate as well. Now, if we do that for the soft switching analysis, if we try that again, you can see E off and E on can be measured again. But um, since E on now is um, nearly lossless due to zero voltage switching, which is usually what we mean when we talk about soft switching, the output energy is simply transferred instead of dissipated. So uh, when we do the same calculation for the total energy, 
and add both values, since there is a different sign on both, uh, we will get to a very low value. And <clears throat> that means um, since most of these measurements uh, or most of the um, values that we get here is just due to non-dissipative charge transfer um, and only a small loss component is hidden in between, it's very hard to really extract this small loss component from this measurement. And therefore, any source of error like DSQ, parasitics in the setup, limited bandwidth, or amplitude error and offset has a very big impact on the result. Therefore, double pulse analysis is not really useful for soft switching analysis. Now, what are the basic requirements for our setup when we do the hard switching evaluation? At first, um, the test setup should be very similar to the final design and therefore usually a half bridge, which is the most common topology, I would say, uh, is a very good choice. And this half bridge needs to be optimized to um, <clears throat> include current and enable precise voltage measurement as well, without adding extra parasitics that will interfere with our switching performance, especially when we try to switch very fast. So what are the main parasitics to, to minimize? First, yeah, it's the commutation loop inductance shown here, which adds overshoot, ringing, and can also be uh, really a stability issue if it gets too large. But also important is uh, reducing the capacitances on the PCB as well as on the test inductor that we are using, because these will introduce extra losses. And um, also, if we do, for example, a QRR analysis, uh, we will also measure the charge that is stored on these parasitic capacitances, which will lead to wrong results. Therefore, these will also need to be minimized. And another point, in general, we need to, uh, to minimize the gate loop inductance in the entire gate loop. But most importantly is the common source inductance, because this really slows down switching transients and can also be a stability issue since it will uh, couple the power loop and the gate loop. And this feedback can be problematic. So what are the basic requirements on the measurement setup? Now, of course, when we want to measure fast devices, we need a rather modern oscilloscope and good probes with high bandwidth. And um, usually the scope and the bandwidth have their own bandwidth written on them. And bandwidth generally means that uh, the measured signal is attenuated by one divided by the square root of two, which is roughly 70% at this um, bandwidth that is written on it. And to get the final uh, system bandwidth of the scope and probes that we are using, a formula like this can be used to calculate this. And it's usually a little bit or depending on the combination, significantly smaller than the bandwidth of the scope and the probe. Uh, it has to be noted that some manufacturers, uh, when you use their probes with their scope, um, guarantee the probe bandwidth as the system bandwidth here. Now, what are the rules of thumb for choice of measurement equipment? Um, often it can be read that the, the system bandwidth should be three to five times larger than the highest frequency component that we want to measure. That will lead to a, an error of two to three percent, as you can see on the right hand side. And also the sample rate should be at least 10 times larger than the maximum frequency, at least when we use linear interpolation, which is probably uh, the most common way to do it in the scope. Now, if we do an estimation for gallium nitride and uh, estimate up to 100 volts per nanosecond at a supply voltage of 400 volts, we can uh, extract a rise time of 3.2 uh, nanoseconds. And that leads us to an equivalent uh, maximum frequency using this well-known formula of 109 megahertz. Now, keep in mind that's uh, only the, the main part of uh, the switching transient. Oscillations at the gate or drain can contain higher frequency components that might be missed if we only optimize our measurement setup for this value. Now let's compare some combinations. If we have a scope of one gigahertz bandwidth and a probe with one gigahertz and use this formula up there, we will get an error of 1.1% 1 .1 at 109 megahertz, which is quite good. But if we go for an older scope, maybe with 500 megahertz or even 350 megahertz, and maybe even use an older probe like a high voltage differential probe with 200 megahertz bandwidth, uh, the error really goes up and we really have to be careful not to, to use too low bandwidth for these investigations because then the result will be quite off. So um, 
On the other hand, one gigahertz is, is not super high end and it should be enough to even capture 100 volts per nanoseconds properly. On to the voltage probes. Um, usually high bandwidth for these high voltage measurements um, is easiest to achieve with passive probes. And these are also easily uh, connected to a low, or for a low side measurement and they're widely available. And the connection of these passive probes, um, that is one big advantage uh, usually can be done with a very small ground loop. So less ground inductance, less parasitic induction that we capture with a ground loop. And why is that important? Now, if we look at a simple equivalent circuit of our measurement uh, that we want to do here on the left-hand side, you can see the signal that we want to measure. And on the right-hand side, you see a simple equivalent circuit of a passive probe, just a parallel capacitor and resistor. And this is the connection inductance. And now if we use values for modern uh, passive probe, like four picofarads, 10 mega ohms, and choose different values for this connection inductance, you can see um, the transfer function. And if we have a very low connection inductance of one nano Henry, um, really um, the gain increase starts beyond one gigahertz. So that's probably fine for most of the measurements. But if we have a, a higher loop inductance, already this increase in the transfer function and this gain area will be in areas where we will see um, oscillations in our circuit. So it's really important to keep this um, this connection inducting small to not interfere with our measurement, especially when it gets too high, we will see excessive ringing, for example, just due to our measurement setup. And this needs to be avoided. If we have a look at different connection examples, we do have this classic ground lead, which is usually not usable for this. If we have to do some kind of connection like this, at least <laughs> twisting it around is an option, but it's still not optimal. Better solutions are, for example, a specific hand wound wire that can be soldered onto the PCB or using the supplied ground spring. But really, the best solution will be using some kind of fixed coaxial or pin connector where we can just plug in the probe. Now, another question, are high voltage differential probes suited for these kinds of measurements? For example, if we want to have a look at the high side measurement. Now, uh, <clears throat> looking at the landscape, currently uh, there are probes available with a bandwidth of up to 400 megahertz. So that might be okay. But uh, most of these high voltage differential probes have limited common mode rejection ratio. And while this rejection ratio is quite high at low frequency, it drops down at high frequency. So the current models that I've um, found have between 26 and 45 decibel at 100 megahertz, which is very close to the 109 megahertz example that we've seen earlier. And what does this common mode rejection ratio mean? Whenever we switch and do a common mode shift of our measurement circuit, um, we will transfer some of this common mode shift into our high side differential measurement. And now if, just a simple uh, calculation, if we have 26 decibel of common mode rejection ratio, we will introduce 20 volts at 400 volts, which is very significant. If we use the high end model with 45 decibel, it will be only 2.25 volts, which might be good enough for a drain source voltage measurement. But if you have a look at the gate source um, transient, it might probably already be too much again. Now, <clears throat> this is only one part. Um, these high voltage differential probes are usually connected with long leads. And similar to the simulation that we've seen on the previous slides, this will introduce some ringing. And as you can see in this example, the high voltage differential probe in red comparing with the passive probe when doing a low side measurement, um, it has much more overshoot and it shows a ringing frequency that is not present in the other measurements. So that is really detrimental and it's not really suitable for analysis. Again, there are optical isolated probes that can be used for these measurements, but these are quite sophisticated and rather expensive. So um, these can be used, but I don't think these are readily available for everyone. So I'm not uh, further focusing on them here. Now for the current probes, this is very important for any switching evaluation because we need the current for our switching loss analysis. 
And these uh, current sensors, these need really need to be part of the measurement system because retrofitting of a very high bandwidth solution is usually not possible without compromising the performance. For example, adding some kind of copper wire to our commutation loop will not, will not be possible without really um, impairing the switching performance. And um, usually since the DIDT values can be rather high with gallium nitride, a solution that is uh, well beyond 100 megahertz of bandwidth is usually required. And also we want to have minimum insertion inductance to not interfere with our switching performance. Now, if you have a look, these quite popular Rogowski calls, these are really neat to have a look, for example, at the load current, but these cannot capture the DIDT of unrestricted GAN devices. Now, if we look a bit further to the right, the current transformer or a field sensors, these can have enough bandwidth, for example, um, roughly 200 or 300 megahertz in this range, but um, it might be hard to um, include them in the design, especially if you can see here, it's, it's rather large. So the design really has to be optimized for it. And it might still be um, <clears throat> more inductance added comparing, for example, to an SMD shunt design, which we used on our um, evaluation board. And these shunts are really, uh, the high end in terms of uh, bandwidth and usually the easiest um, to use solution because you can just measure the voltage and calculate back directly the current and you don't have to do, for example, integrations here. Now, measurement preparation. This might sound quite obvious, but it's, it's a list of items that I usually use when I do my double pass tests. And this is, um, it starts with probe compensation. That is really important because uh, when you measure the one kilohertz standard signal, you will see some bending and this will not be visible in these short double pulses. And it will manifest as an amplitude error that is very significant on the results. Also very important is uh, custom de-skewing between current and voltage probes. Usually you can extract or get the information on the delay from the data sheet, but it's really important to, to do this custom de-skewing with your own probes because there is some, some shift between the standard value and your own setup, which is possible. Only a few hundred picoseconds can impact the result already. Also important, removal of offset, of course, running at maximum bandwidth, and also using the full vertical scale of the scope just to get a better resolution of the results. And that's also uh, leading to the next point, the acquisition mode. Most scopes have a sample mode, high resolution mode or average mode. And all of these are basically um, good enough for the general investigations. But if you plan, for example, on doing uh, longer uh, integrations at low amplitudes, it might be beneficial to go for high resolution or averaging. And um, since the double pulse can be repeated several times with similar results, averaging is easily possible in the double pulse. Now, on to the determination of switching energies. Here again, you can see uh, a double pulse waveform with voltages and currents. And what we do is we simply multiply current and voltage. That leads us to the power loss. And then we will um, define an integration uh, time period where we do um, the integration of the power loss vector to get an energy. And here, if we do that for this turn-on process, we can see quite a clear um, interval and a rather large um, turn on energy in comparison to turn off, which is a little bit more tricky, as you can see in the right hand side, even with a good design, um, that test design was uh, less than 10 nano Henry's of commutation loop inductance, you can still introduce a certain amount of ringing and there it's always the question where to start and where to stop. It's not as clear cut. Does it look like this? Or does it look like this? So it's, it's um, more uh, important to really have a look at where to start and stop the intervals here than for the turn on transient. And for example, if you do a long integration, any offset error will uh, clearly impact the results. So it's really important to have a clear look here. And it's quite tricky to do, to do that directly on the scope. And therefore, some post-processing is usually beneficial to do. Now, if you do, uh, or some examples are, if you uh, use a field sensor, for example, you will need to do some post-processing uh, post anyway. For example, integrating the signal and removing offsets. But also, for example, if you do the test and have some low frequency oscillation of the power supply circuit on your measurements, you might also need to correct that. 
Also, as mentioned, the integration limits have to be checked. Do we start and stop at steady state values or will we capture some of the extra energy stored in our parasitics on the way that will also lead to errors and needs to be prevented? And also a very sophisticated thing to do, which is something that I don't do, but if you have clear knowledge about our, your measurement uh, setup and your probes, you can also apply the inverse to improve the results. But yeah, this is something that I don't do at the moment because I think the results are already quite, quite precise. Now for the switching energies to be shown here, you can see um, when we do this double pulse test and analysis, you see the E off values are much smaller than the E on, and that is to be expected. And just a small thing that you can do to, um, <clears throat> as a plausibility check for this, um, at E on at zero amps, you can do a simple calculation with datasheet values. You just take the VDC times QOSS from the datasheet, which is basically this square or rectangle, um, and then you can subtract the stored energy on the device because this will be dissipated internally and it will not be visible on the outside. Also, you need to add a little bit for the energy stored in the parasitic capacitance. And if this is rather close to the measured values, you are on a good track. And you can do the same for the E off at low current. And here it's just, here in green, uh, the area EOSS should be a constant value when you do fast switching for the GAN devices. So that's also another possibility check that you can do. Now, finally, for the soft switching, uh, analysis, which is not possible, at least with good precision in the double pulse setup, you can do it with an indirect method, and this leads to much higher precision. Um, I'm showing two um, <clears throat> different variants. On the left-hand side, the so-called bridge lag in the box method, as uh, proposed by ETH Zürich, at least in a very similar way. Um, here, you have an isolation box where you put your bridge lag into and you operate it at a rather high switching frequency. And the calorimetric method is basically uh, the back calculation of the temperature change in this box. And by that, um, the determination of losses that are, well, dissipated inside of the box. So that's indirect measurement number one. The requirements for this is it requires a very thorough calibration of the isolation box. That's very important to get good results. And also, not only the devices will produce losses, but also, for example, if you have your gate drive inside of the box, this will add something. But also on the PCB and the capacitor, when current is flowing, you will introduce some extra losses. So you need to have good knowledge about these other loss components to get good results. Slightly different method is the so-called opposition method that has been proposed by several researchers as well. Um, here we use two bridge legs um, to produce a circulating current in our um, H-bridge. And this circulating current, as it produces mostly reactive power, um, <clears throat> is mostly lossless. So only the losses that we create on the right-hand side here have to be supplied by the left-hand side as a small DC current flowing into the system. So um, <clears throat> this is really beneficial because um, we can measure this small DC current with a power analyzer and therefore um, extract the total amount of losses in the bridge. But obviously we need a second bridge lag, a low loss inductor for this setup. Um, and also, again, very good knowledge about the other loss components in our system to get precise results. But overall, this higher complexity will be rewarded with a sub-microjoule precision that can be achieved with both methods. And um, for our CC pack, we chose the method on the left-hand side and did some investigations. And as you can see here on the right-hand side, the results are in the low single-digit range in terms of microjoules. We plotted it over the results that have been <clears throat> initially proposed by ETH Zürich, although I'm well aware that um, there has been an update by them um, that also presents slightly different soft switching energies. But just to show, we are roughly in the same ballpark here. And yeah, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. And um, you can find further information on the GAN devices at nextperiod.com slash GANFETs. And with that, I would like to hand back to the Q&A panel or for the Q&A session to the panel. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sebastian. Great presentation. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so let's take one quick question. Um, how high is QRR for the cascade? Cascode, sorry. Well, that depends on the size of the device. For the Geno 39, it's roughly 100 nanocoulombs. So it's very close to the QOSS value. The QRR that is introduced by the low voltage MOSFET is, is very small since it's only a 30 volt MOSFET. All right. On the, on the minute, I would say this uh, concludes and ends this live session. So thank you, uh, Sebastian and Giuliano. And if you want to know more about the GAN uh, devices, follow the resource link underneath the screen. And if you have a question, so there were more questions, but please uh, add them also in the, in the chat box so you can uh, chat to a, a power expert. And please stay around. Our next live session on GAN quality and reliability will start after a short break. <laughs>